Finally, we have fermentation. When oxygen is not available, fermentation is a very common choice, especially among anaerobic pathogens. Now, let me point out that there are a lot of different definitions in common use for fermentation, and we need to clarify how we're using the term. Uh, one through four are not how we're using it. Five is how we're using it. Uh, the food production industry in particular has co-opted this term fermentation for many of their own uses. Spoilage of food by microorganisms is often simply referred to as fermentation. Oh no, the mayonnaise has fermented. Whether or not actual biochemical fermentation has taken place, it's often referred to as a fermentation. The production of various foods, like alcoholic beverages or acidic dairy products, um, intentionally using microbes is referred to as a fermentation. In many cases, it is biochemical fermentation, but there, it's not necessarily always that. Um, and so, again, the food industry will often refer to any food production using microbes as fermentation. <clears throat> it turns out that in industry, we produce a lot of our chemicals, whether it's cleaning agents or chemicals for research and so on, um, using microorganisms. And when those are scaled up, when those processes are scaled up to large tanks and vats, we refer to that whole process as a fermentation. And those containers are referred to as fermenters, again, regardless of whether or not it's biochemical fermentation. Number four is probably the most insidious because it finds its way into textbooks too. Very often, any anaerobic energy yielding process is called fermentation. And yet from the last video, we know that anaerobic cell respiration is indeed not fermentation. We're gonna see here in a minute that fermentation does not make use of an external electron acceptor, doesn't use an electron transport chain, and it doesn't use a Krebs cycle. Okay, so by definition, fermentation is not any form of cell respiration. Unfortunately, some textbooks lump them all together. If it's anaerobic, they call it fermentation. Be on the lookout for that. So what is fermentation? It's an anaerobic energy yielding process that doesn't use electron transport system. That is the simplest way to distinguish fermentation from uh, any form of cell respiration. <clears throat> so if we go back to this diagram here, let's start with glycolysis. Let's look at the fermentation of glucose. It starts with glycolysis and our six carbon glucose gets split into two three carbon pyruvates. We get our two ATPs, yay, and we get these two high energy electron carrier molecules in ABH. Stop and think for a minute. What's the problem here? What's going to limit this from just continuing on throughout the entire lifetime of the cell? It's not going to be ADP because, yeah, the cell made some ATPs and consumed some ADPs, but it's going to use those ATPs. It's going to go out in the world and, you know, transport something against its gradient or whatever it needs to do with its ATPs, right? It, it's got a lot of high energy demands. You know, it's got to make, uh, uh, make new DNA molecules and RNA molecules and proteins. And that's all going to take energy. So the ADP will get recycled and be able to be reused. What about the NADH? Right? If you think about cell respiration, how do we get our NAD plus back to support this process? we got to dump the electrons out of that NADH into the electron transport chain. That gives us our NAD plus back, and we can keep glycolysis going. Right? NAD plus is a coenzyme that's absolutely required for the function of a couple of the enzymes in glycolysis, a couple of dehydrogenases. We can't just run out of NAD+, and you can't stuff an NADH in there because it can't collect any more electrons. So how are we going to recycle, regenerate our NAD+. That's the problem that fermentation solves. There's no electron transport chain because we're, we don't have one. We're, we're undergoing fermentation. Maybe the species doesn't even have the ability to use an electron transport chain. But we still have to regenerate our NAD+. So what do we do? We're going to dump the electrons that the NADH is carrying back into the pyruvate itself. Or we might modify the pyruvate to some derivative and dump the electrons into that, depending on the species. So you see, our electron donor is some portion of the glucose. Our electron acceptor is still some portion of that original molecule. Yeah, it's been split and broken up into pyruvate, but it's still the same carbon atoms. We've stripped the electrons off of one location in the molecule, and we're dumping them back into a different location in the same molecule. All right? The whole process is self-contained. Fermentation is quite distinct. There is no external electron acceptor. The electron donor essentially provides 
the electron acceptor. Now, when we dump those electrons into pruvate or some derivative, we have three categories of products that can be produced depending on the species of bacteria and the molecule that's being fermented. We're looking at glucose here, but the, just about anything you can dream of can be fermented. <clears throat> the three categories are going to be organic acids, that, for example, lactic acid. That's what you and I do. We are homolactic fermenters when our muscles ferment. Uh, acetic acid. Any of these ic acids can be potential, um, potential uh, uh, fermentation end products. Alcohols can be potential fermentation end products. Ethanol, methanol, any of the OL endings. And then gases. In particular, hydrogen gas, that's H2, methane, that's CH4, and carbon dioxide, CO2. Those are the three most common gases. Different species start in using different uh, starting substrates, we'll come up with different combinations of organic acids, alcohols, and or gases, depending on what they're all about. Now let's finish this discussion by looking at this little map here. Right down the middle, you've got your, your sugars going into glycolysis, uh, leading eventually to, to Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. This process is called the central metabolism because regardless of what carbs we're using, we can usually feed them into this process. Regardless of proteins we might be using, we can break down amino acids into fragments that will feed into either glycolysis or the Krebs cycle. And even if we're feeding off of lipids, and I say we because this process is identical in you and me and identical in E. coli, all right? We can break lipids down into fragments that will fit into glycolysis and the Krebs cycle as well. It's central because no matter what an organism is eating, it can feed it into one of these stages and ultimately drive electron transport and, uh, and chemiosmosis and oxidative phosphorylation. All right, we've talked a lot about in these videos um, cell respiration and fermentation. I think you should spend as much time as you can in these videos with your textbook and bring me any questions that you have.